presentations is Jacob Heftman, who's um, uh, who's running a design studio called Twenty Nine. And welcome, Jacob. So to answer this brief, I kind of I had to like um, kind of step back and figure out the context um, that we're finding ourselves in. So let's see, I have to do this in two places. Bear with me. Um, so I realized that when the invitations went out for this, my website, I guess I'd broken it. Um, so that, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, I'm, my name's Jacob. I'm a adjunct faculty here in both, um, the BFA and MPS programs. Um, and I run a very, very small design studio called 29 here in New York. Um, but first I want to back up a little bit. Um, I'm originally from San Diego, uh, after high school, all I wanted to do was live um, in a place with good surf. So I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, there's no design program there. There is barely an art school, um, fine art program there. So I studied philosophy and art history. Um, yeah, those were my goals at the time. After graduation, I spent a few kind of directionless years in my mid-20s um, trying to figure out what to do with those degrees until this happened. Um, this was the introduction of the iPhone in 2007. Um, I thought this is going to um, be a really big deal and someone probably has to make the stuff that happens on the screens. I didn't know anything beyond that. Um, I didn't know what that meant, how to get there, who that person was. Um, but after a chance encounter, someone gave me um, an opportunity to be a design intern. So at the... Uh, Age of 26, I got my first job in design, uh, knew basically nothing. Um, that turned into an in-house product design role at a startup in back in San Diego. Um, I did that for a little bit, and then I was like, wow, there's a big world out there, and a lot of it seems to be like kind of centered in New York. Typical New Yorker thing to say, I guess. Um, <laughs> after, um, so I moved to New York, and I started working in agencies um, in the same space, so working with technology products and um, startups. And somewhere in there, I was like, um, wow, all the work that I like and am interested in and is really speaking to me is happening over here in this graphic design world. Um, and then what I'm doing is over there in that other digital design world. And they don't seem to be connected. Um, the emojis to me is my favorite one. Um, so I was like, how, like, why and how do you bridge that gap? Um, and that kind of became like a mission for me. Um, so at the age of, I went on to work at some agencies as I was kind of figuring it out, left, um, became an independent designer. That's like a fancy way of saying like unemployed or freelance or whatever, kind of figuring it out. Um, eventually I linked up with my friend Jake, um, who was also kind of like asking some of these same questions and we started working together. Um, we put together a business, I mean, we didn't put together a business plan, but like if I think back on it, like, these are kind of like our founding like principles. Um, graphic design on screens, um, do the opposite of agencies. Code is a design tool. We're interested in many aspects of design. Um, client work funds our own projects. And those were our, our principles. I mean, these are terrible. That's a bad business plan. Um, <laughs> and why am I telling you all of this? Um, so basically, I had no formal training, very little. Um, job experience. I was kind of like a tech industry dropout, um, and I preferred individual sports to like anything that seemed like group affiliation. Um, that makes me seem like a terrible person to work with. Like um, so, I guess my point is that doing things wrong comes very easily to me. It's basically like all I know. Um, I never learned anything the right way. So, like people used to always say, "Oh, your work really—it's like different," and I was like. Thank you, I guess. I don't know. Um, but then I learned to kind of embrace that. Um, so naturally, like, I've always been kind of attracted to this um, outsider mentality. And this, this is much later that I found this quote, but um, someone who was work I really looked up to called Mark Kramers. Um, this really resonated with me. Um, I think designers naturally just want to fit in, have a nice, cute life, do nice, cute things, work hard, be nice to people, read kinfolk, raw denim, beards, flat whites, nice fonts, nice illustrations, nice design, go with the flow, just good, tasteful things, experiences, and activities. 
Um, and before you know it, your life is an Instagram feed literally indistinguishable to any other designer's nice Instagram feed. You melt it into the digital soup. I don't know if this rant makes any sense, but I guess my awareness or fear of this singularity is just naturally percolating in my work. So I was like, oh, there's someone else. I'm not just like angry. Or maybe I'm angry, but there's like more angry people. Um, <laughs> and so um, I really like, I thought about this idea of the singularity and I was like, how, okay, so this is starting to make sense, like this divide and, and, and I, I wanted to know how we got here. So I have this working theory. I've never tried it out on, any, on anyone. So bear with me. This has always existed as notes, which I'm just going to try and like verbalize to you in some way that makes sense. Um, so not too much after I found that quote, I was reading New York Magazine. I read this. Um, Blank is also the first brand to speak the visual language of the millennial. Paragraph, lots of white space, simple fonts. Um, I kept thinking about this. It was kind of weird to me because I was coming from the other side of this process, like as a designer looking out and understanding how these things get made. Um, and I didn't feel like anyone, like there was this like all knowing like savant who like decided that this is what millennials want. Um, I kind of looked at it as like the result of some larger forces possibly. So I thought back to my art history degree and I was like, wow, most um, visual um, like aesthetic trends are a reaction to like global forces or like macro trends. Um, so, I mean, everyone loves Bauhaus, right? And then um, this is Erasmus, so uh, humanist renaissance. Um, so I thought back to 2008 because that's like when I started to feel this weird like dissonance um, in like the work I wanted to do and the work I was doing. Um, and I was like, what happened in 2008? Um, Barack Obama, great. I mean, really, that was awesome. But a couple other weird things happened, which um, were, which was a financial crisis, um, and like the advent of smartphones. So this is just following like so the iPhone was announced in 2007, I guess, actually released in 2008, um, and they precipitated a few really big changes, which I've tried to like filter into something coherent. Um, let's try it. So the first one was the framework for the web as we know it. Um, smartphones proliferate the app store launches in 2008. Um, that mixed with the economic crisis and like the apps that were coming out. Um, the shifting job market resulted in the gig economy um, and digital products like they go mainstream finally. Of course, like Facebook launched a bunch of years earlier, um, but this is when these things were like, this is how you did stuff is like on the internet. Um, from there, we go to the proliferation of digital stuff. So as there are more devices, there are more screen sizes, there's more digital advertising, there's more emails being sent, there's more stuff to make, teams grow, um, and roles become increasingly specialized because we have these giant companies with systems and managers and levels and all this stuff. Um, I'm going really fast because I have a lot to go through, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll also breathe. Um, so then startup economics. Um, everything's based on volume. So articles, posted, clicks, impressions, likes, users, views, these are all like, that's what matters. Um, investment makes profitability second to growth. Growth is the number one. Tech products become giant systems and they're kind of like untethered from like reality. So digital technology and economics fall out of sync. Um, maybe I haven't done a good job of connecting the dots, especially for a room full of visual people. Um, so let's look at this magazine as an example. This is one I actually give to my students. So those of you that have had a class with me have seen this. I updated the image, actually. Um, why does the printed version of the magazine look like this? This is um, from Wired. Like, it's not an especially, it's like, they're all nice. It's not an especially, like, can't pick one by any means. Um, and so that's the printed one. And then the online one looks like this. Why is that? So we have like this extremely simplified version, um, a bunch of other stuff to distract you, a bunch of things that you may or may not want to do. Um, <laughs> okay, so like why? And then that disconnect is exactly like why I was bored or not fulfilled or whatever. Um, Here's another kind of, here's another example that's been going around recently. Um, like this is um, the proliferation of one, and I'm not picking on like this style specifically, just to call out like a trend that's happening um, of illustration in like specifically startups. Um, 
This is from Koivin's blog. He wrote about this. Um, but it's worth taking a step back to examine the way our products use illustration and trying to understand why we've all settled on this particular approach. It probably wouldn't be far off base to assume that a lot of these illustrations were done not by professional illustrators, but by product designers who also have some illustration talent themselves. Um, they designed the app, and while they were at it, it was faster and cheaper just to have them create the illustrations too. He goes on to conclude, in fact, it might actually be desirable for some brands to look, you know, distinctive and unique. Um, okay, so, like, I'm not the only person that's feeling this way. Um, and I don't blame designers. They, well, I kind of will later. Um, <laughs> but designers get into a tough spot because of a bunch of different things that are happening. So we don't really know what we're designing anymore. There's tons of screen sizes. We don't know the capabilities of the device. We don't know the context of the user when they're looking at the thing we made. Um, Software is very hard to visualize. Like that's why startups always default to like stock imagery or this standard illustration style because like what does software look like really? Um, like screenshots are pretty boring. So how do you make someone excited to sign up for your thing? Um, roles become increasingly specialized. Um, maybe that was like a team that used to have an art director and an illustrator and a photo director and a copy editor. Now you're just like a product designer basically. Um, abundance of templated solutions. So this is like the loss of control over where your content lives and how it's presented. So things like um, Facebook, Squarespace. Um, visual overload. So just like the proliferation of images in social media platforms, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest. Um, so visual trends are extremely um, short-lived. Those cycles are fast. Um, and basically like um, wood boarding becomes this virus of homogenization. Um, and then commercial is cool. Like if you're a child of the 90s, selling out was like the worst thing. It was so taboo. But literally selling out became the paramount goal for everyone um, is like that was success was selling your startup. So quite literally selling out was the goal. Um, and that for me, like coming from great skateboarding was like so weird. Um, so I guess reframed, my question is, what is the role of the designer in a future where every website is just a Facebook page, every online store is an Amazon shop, every blog is a Medium page, every portfolio is an Instagram account? And um, designers themselves have kind of been co-opted into this system um, that is approaching what I think of as the singularity. So um, why? Well, here's a couple I want to address. Um, this is... Sorry to throw some stones, but um, so the cult of minimalism. Um, this, so my background is in philosophy, and in philosophy we're taught that um, one way you can invalidate or validate an argument is to test it at its extreme. So this is minimalism at its most extreme. It's incredibly homogenizing, as you can see. So like if we all made this, we'd all look the same. That's pretty boring. Um, so here's something that I'm interested in. Um, in art history, I studied Bernini a lot. Um, this is the altar at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Um, this is um, not a particularly minimal design, but if you want to convince people of the existence of a higher being, um, this is an extremely effective design for doing that. Um, it's fantastic. And it's craftsmanship and it's all this great stuff. Um, so we've been led to believe that minimalism is this highest order design goal. Um, but sometimes complexity is necessary, and a designer's job, in my opinion, is to manage complexity. So, um, UX is dogma. Um, I have my students read the $300 million button. It's a really interesting article. Basically, the bottom line is that um, a large company made one small UX change, and their bottom line grew like by $300 million. Bottom line grew. They made more money, whatever. Um, and it's very hard as a designer to argue against that. Like, that is always going to win any argument about, like, let's try something new, let's try something different, um, let's experiment. Like, that will shut down any conversation. So um, if no one ever tried anything new, I guess we'd have, like, the same websites we've had since, like, 1999. Um, we'd also probably kind of not have a soul. So that one's hard to argue against. Um, I don't really know how videos work, so let me just... Is it going? Should it go? There we go. Did it play? Oh, it's fine. This is something I saw recently on the design blog of a large tech company. Um, the idea is that they would turn their sketches into designs using their design pattern library and image recognition software. Um, so you can either see this as this amazing design 
um, like tool technological advancement, or you can see this as a way for a giant company to more efficiently hollow out city centers to rent to like tourists, um, and also probably lay off some designers while you're doing it. So I don't know, ruthless efficiency, is that a great goal? I'm not sure. Um, and our tools um, themselves have changed a lot. So that's Illustrator, I like Illustrator. Um, that sketch, these are both the, the, the options for typography in their respective programs. Um, so even our tools have um, traded power, power in crafting original expressive typography and image, imagery for basically facilitating easier repetition of um, variations on patterns. And I was really resistant to sketch for a long time, and I was like, I'm so stubborn. Um, maybe I'm getting old, I don't know. And then I realized that like, it just felt like the craft was like leaving our process. I mean, I use it, I get it, but like, I don't love it. Um, and then another one is, again, like not to throw stones, like they're beautiful objects, but I think just how we talk about systems and asking some questions about like the things we fetishize is important. Like, I think it's ironic that these are all um, like public, huge public institutions that need this level of like standardization um, and they're for the public good. These institutions have all been gutted recently. Um, so, and this is not how we document like design when it, design moves as quickly as it does um, when we're building digital things. So I think like just thinking about how we talk about design, design systems is also incredibly important. So, um, great, okay, but wait, there is good news. Um, if you wanna read a lot more about this, some of these ideas, I recommend Billionaire's Type Writer by Matt. It's a fantastic article. He does a better job of breaking this down, um, but he's connecting like all these kinds of ideas as well. Um, so I just wanted to shout him out right there. Um, but so there is good news, and that is that there are more independent designers taking um, risks in their work. Um, actually, it was really hard to find an example of a magazine to show you guys because I started that exercise like three or four years ago, and it was like really miserable. Um, like that parallel and the articles online are like much better more interesting and better represented now so that's great um more people are talking about this that's why i mentioned um uh, matthew Butter butterick right here and then with recent events around privacy and data there's increasing it increasing attention on things like distributed internet and how um to have these more autonomous sorts of, sorts of systems or fun systems i suppose um and then <laughs> This is something I saw recently, um, which one of the two possible websites are you currently designing? Which, like, there's a time when I would have seen this and been like, yeah, you tell them. Um, but now I actually don't blame designers in any way because I've been the designer that didn't have a lot of options for like how to get a create, how to have a creative solution. Because I wasn't given the tools and I wasn't given the support and infrastructure to do that. So I don't blame designers. I'm looking more at the system that creates that as a design solution. Um, there are so many designers doing amazing work that are breaking out of this, and I don't actually see this as the reality anymore. I see so many creative, it's like hard to keep up with how many good things are happening in digital, digital design. Now, um, there's a crazy number of people doing great work. So I don't feel like this is true, actually, anymore. Which is great, that's a relief. Um, so I guess I had to set the context to understand my own practice, um, and I wanna show just like very quickly, a little bit of what I've been working on. Um, so to me, like the power of um, a designer isn't to like make a huge app that a bunch of people use that I don't feel comfortable like completing a lot of people use. <laughs> to me, I'd rather just do something small that touches like a few people in an interesting way. So um, instead of building like giant systems that are have more humanity in them, I'm interested in kind of subverting those systems um, just in very small ways. Um, so year five of our studio, we have a, still a bad business plan, but hopefully a little bit better. Um, help independent businesses grow. I mean, that's a fancy way of saying client work because that's like how we support the other. Support designers through collaboration, um, through thoughtful tools, through experiences, and through opportunities to pursue non-commercial work. And I'll show you quickly how I do, how we do that stuff. Um, first, I don't know what the segue was to this, but is there ever a case for shitty design? Um, I got this question pretty recently from a client. It was the most astute 
um, client question I've probably ever gotten. And I very, very um, enthusiastically replied yes and showed them our website. Um, there is definitely a case for shitty design. Um, this is um, a temporary site we launched about three years ago. It's still our website. Um, the client was tactful, so he said he meant something more like Craigslist. Um, but I understood that what he was really asking was, is there ever a case when something's design can fail to communicate authenticity or value or truth or honesty because it's so big or so polished or so fancy or feels like it's from this corporation that um, it's not really believable. Um, and so when this launched, I was, I was so uncomfortable with the idea of launching it because it's wrong in so many ways. Um, it's like a non-standard to navigate, whatever you could say is to navigate. Um, it's just like there's a very, very personal message underneath the work um, that like, I was uncomfortable making public. There's like so much that's weird about it. Um, and I was like, it's okay, it's just temporary. We'll take it down and put something real up. And then what, a weird thing happened is people were like, we love the message you're sending. Um, actually, one person was like, this is the worst website I've ever seen. And I was like, the I mean, come on, man. There's like the worst. Sure. <laughs> um, but um, generally, the response was that, like, hey, we get what you're saying. We get what you're trying to do. It feels like there's some soul. So we're like, cool, let's run with that. Um, so the first one is help independent gro businesses grow. We like to work with people who are starting businesses, um, mostly here in New York. And I'll just flash through a couple of these. Um, this is OK Real. Uh, this is. Oh, this is the second website we ever launched as a, a studio. I just mean like it was just Jake and I. Um, we built this. A lot of people like ended up reading the site, and um, Amy's done really well with it. And I showed this because um, we actually did this for basically no money, and we didn't have the luxury of turning down work because it was like too small. And I don't like design advice that's like follow your dreams and turn down bad projects. I mean like. Not everyone has a privilege to turn down work. So like, it was a very small project. We needed to do it. And it actually, what we did was we traded a little bit of money. Well, we traded money for creative freedom. And we got to do something that we love. And it actually helped propel us to the next level of um, our, our life as a design studio. Um, this is um, actually photos that were sent by um, our moderator, Carly. To, my partner, Jake, of some packaging that she found in the store. Um, this is food packaging we did. There's an interactive part too, but it's um, food packaging. Um, the pattern comes from the ingredients in the food. Um, store shelves are crazy, I guess, on the topic of differentiation. Like, what you see on shelves packaging is, like, wild. So we did a bunch of research, and that was really interesting. Um, this, I just really wanted an excuse to show it, because, like, the client didn't want them to get it. They wanted it to be really big. Um, so this is, like... It's a moment to shine. Um, <laughs> Ant Food is a small creative studio. And that was a restaurant in LA. This is a small creative studio um, in Brooklyn. They work with audio. They do amazing like sounds, and they have a ton of fun. They have all these weird cool instruments. They let us put these weird creatures all over their website, which are really funny, and they make a ton of sound. And it's like kind of an annoying experience. But like, they were like, it's really fun, and it's awesome. And there is a mute button, so whatever. Um, um, and then the next thing we do is support designers through collaboration. We realized that our message was really, really resonating with designers. Um, so we recently worked with IBM to launch their um, new corporate typeface called IBM Flex. We built, built this design and built this website with them. Um, wanted to show off the type um, as big as possible. I like everything really high. Um, so we came up with these horizontal sliders to scroll through it. And then um, the site kind of goes through this like very long narrative. We were given a 220 page research document outlining like the history of design at IBM and why they were doing this and all the languages and every single glyph. And like our task was to turn that 220 page document into a website. Some people said it was too long, but I was like, yo, a million people worked on this typeface and it's like this huge design legacy that Paul Rand started. I don't care if the website's long. We're going to make a long website and we're going to make some funny arrows to navigate around it. Um, so that's what we did. Um, we had the opportunity to do some explorations when Dropbox was doing the rebrand. None of this stuff happened, um, unfortunately, but um, this is the first time it's ever been shown. So that's kind of exciting for me. Um, they had 
uh, this design system that was mostly just static. Um, and they asked us to understand how it could work on screens, how these like different planes would move and interact in a digital um, environment. So we had done a project earlier with this idea of like type point from condensed to thing based on its container. So we did some like static kind of experiments here, um, some like really rough prototypes of how a system like this could work. Um, we're still a very small studio at this time, so we had a blast designing this stuff. Um, working with a big company was something I learned about in the process. Um, so none of this stuff launched, but it was still cool to do. These were other pages of the site. Um, Google asked us to kind of also similar idea of take these like static shapes that they had have and figure out how they would live online and how you could match them with like a usable interactive experience. So we did some explorations around how these things could animate. That wasn't actually it. Um, what we ended up making was like this. So there were these prompts. And this is for their design prompts. But this is where you can see these vignettes. And there's a few different ways that they behave, and there's these layers that operate. In um, and at some point, you can see through them, and so there's interesting opportunities for how you can interact with this moment. Um, uh, cool. So that's like kind of the um, like, yeah, that stuff. Um, support designers through thoughtful tools. That's the next one that we're interested in. This is um, something called Small Victories. We um, make, build, work with, work on. Um, it's a platform for hosting websites using the files that are already on your computer. Um, right now it's using Dropbox, but you can use like Drive or a centralized internet, let's say, um, to do that. Um, and what we like about this is um, it gives you control over your platform without needing to know a bunch of technical skills. In fact, it actually is a great way to learn to code because it's just kind of like tweaking your MySpace page in a lot of ways. Um, we realize that most websites fall into a few different like needs. Web pages fall into a few needs and design patterns. So you can actually piece together a website with like a slideshow and a feed of images and some text and stuff. So you can kind of like piece these together. Um, there's no publishing, there's no CMS, it just kind of goes onto the internet immediately. Um, and we, in doing this, we thought a lot about um, our values for making a digital product. We identified some things that we were really interested in. Uh, I mentioned decentralization before, but also, um, you know, for us, creating is always better than consuming, and um, just some stuff like that that we've been thinking about as it comes to digital products, how we spend our time, et cetera. So this is like a new information for our Then you put the image in, in your finder, and then if you refresh your website, it's online. So you can collaborate um, very easily by sharing the Dropbox folder. It has a URL. You can all that stuff. Um, I could talk about this. It's like a thing that I'm really into, believe in. Um, what's cool to, to see is how designers specifically use it, how everyone uses it, but designers especially are doing some really interesting things with it. This is a site by um, Robbie Young, a designer here in New York, who basically just throws every day. He's kind of making these sketches that are totally outside of what he does at his job and just chucking them into this folder and they appear on the web. It was like, told us that it was a way for him to force himself to make this stuff and also share it. Um, so we love, we really loved hearing that story. Um, okay, support designers through experiences. Um, this is a book that Jake, um, my video partner, and I made uh, 2014, I guess. Um, Jake moved to Portland. We had to figure out how to collaborate, so we ended up like squatting in a bunch of different people's studios and traveling and trying to like maintain this like very young guy. Um, so we turned it into a book at the end of the year, and. Um, after the book came out, we're like, well, that was fun. Like, what do we, how do we get other people to like participate in this? Um, so we call it Atelier, um, and we kind of opened it up as this platform where you could apply for a residency in our space, and we asked other people to also participate either by like, 
um, working out of someone else's space or offering your own space. It's totally non-commercial. You can just go and like work somewhere. Um, these are past residents that we've had in our studio. They come with a project in mind and they publish some of this stuff that we've made. Um, and it's been amazing to watch people like um, have this opportunity where maybe they couldn't have afforded to like spend a month in New York otherwise. Um, come with a totally different perspective, um, learn about their design culture, where they're from, um, see what they're working it's been, it's been an amazing experience. Um, this is our most recent designer, Inigo. He came from Pueblo, Mexico. He produced some beautiful work while he was in the studio. It was a pleasure to have him. I learned all kinds of things about the election in Mexico. It was great. Um, like what it's like to be in a designer a designer in Pueblo, Mexico. Like, I had no idea. Um, fascinating. Super great. Um, and then maybe the last one, support designers through opportunities to do non-commercial work. I guess that's kind of away from the last one. Um, but this is our studio. It's in the East Village. It's on the ground level, which affords us opportunity, opportunity to have kind of like a walk-in space. Um, and we let designers do basically whatever they want in that space. Um, this is a poster, digital poster for um, a show called Touchy Art. This is the group from Play Lab. They had the first exhibition in our space called Walking Phoenix, um, in which they invited Bucky to walk by our studio. He didn't come, but they did also make some beautiful prints um, that they showed in the space and had a great party and kicked off um, what's been a really fun series of different events and exhibitions. Uh, oops, wrong keyboard. This is the launch of GT America. Um, that's a gigantic Swiss, kind of Swiss American flag that we got yelled at for having. Um, this is a series of talks called Arts and Sciences run by Nitsan, a member here at Parsons, um, Michael Yaku, uh, just a really interesting thinker who was talking about um, this system. Yeah, um, it was really great. Um, and this is an ongoing thing that we're doing. And it's not really like a, something that would necessarily get an audience somewhere else. So we're happy to host events like this. Um, this is a store where you can sell stuff that you make if you're a designer. Um, there's a bunch of stuff from past shows, that football, someone left at the studio. Um, that's, uh, one of our studio mates never uses this monitor, so we decided to put it on the store for sale. Um, with, uh, the caption Dell monitor, Dell desktop monitor, approximately 2015 vintage. Uh, decent resolution, 23 and a half inches wider, two and a half inches less wide than competitive Apple product, not Retina, um, lightly used. So, yeah, I mean, totally not serious, um, but like just kind of a place where you can do things that, like, we don't need to make money from the store, fortunately, so we can um, just to see what happens. And then this is the website, which is a good place to find out about upcoming events. Please join us. Um, it's also the first place we can experiment with what future work. Um, but it's a good place to find out what's going on in the studio, participate, come by, say hello, email us, um, all of that stuff, and then some thank yous. And that's it. So thank you so much, Jacob. And thank you so much for every speaker today. And we're going to move on to our panel discussion. Uh, let, let's just give another round of applause. Thank you so much.